and Kathy, what are we talking about or looking at out here? Okay, here we're going to talk a little bit about the citrus industry. Once the trees were all planted and ready to grow and had matured enough that you could get an, a, a commercial crop, you would have to kind of join up with a packing house and join their exchange and that would help you reach into the markets and it would also help you get the workers so that there was a picking crew that would come along and they would there would be a foreman and the foreman would have his crew come what would happen is that the crew members would have to purchase their picking sack their clips and they would have to pay for their ride out to the groves so once they got out to the groves they would be able to take their picking sack and wear it over their shoulder and then they would take a ladder and we have a ladder here from the Bradford brothers it's got a label on it that they had used in their picking industry in their citrus part of the industry and they uh, would climb up the ladder now that you can see this bag is very big and if you figure it's going to be full of heavy oranges that you want to go to the top of the ladder first before the bag gets filled up and pick and fill the bag as you come down so as you're picking the oranges off of the tree this bag gets fuller and fuller so you get down to the bottom of the tree and here is a, a field bag a field cr crate and it opens like this and you would dump the oranges out like that and then you would scurry back to your task as a picker because you were paid by the box and so you wanted to get as many boxes filled as you could so you can see the boxes are quite large and it would take a while for you to get all of your oranges picked the um, oranges Oh, let's see what else can I tell you about that. Um, the oranges were then shipped down to the packing house in these huge boxes and then they were washed because sometimes you would get red scale or black scale and that all had to be washed off of the oranges. Um, even just the dust from accumulating if you've had smudge pots you would have to get all of that washed off and then it would be sorted according to the size and there would be large sizes and the, the smaller sizes and the ladies who were packing the oranges would rotate that sometime during the shift you would get the large oranges so you could pack a lot of crates at a time and without a whole lot of, of effort but if you got the smaller oranges you then had to pack a longer time for one crate to get filled up because you had to wrap each orange in a tissue paper and once you became a sun-kissed grower that was the trademark of a sun-kissed grower and then there were um, people on the East Coast who would not be able to shift inferior oranges and, and call them sun-kissed because they wouldn't have the paper wrapped around it. So that was a security issue that the packing houses developed around here. So once they were shipped, once they were washed and they were being sorted, they were put into uh, shipping crates and we saw the labels that go on the shipping crates inside. So um, these are the ones that were just stamped on so that when they got to the packing house they would know which picker was there because you would have multiple pickers coming in and, and then you would know who's going to get paid for how many oranges. So they would, one lady told me that they would have a box building machine. Every um, packing house had its own box machine and she said they just fed in slats and a box came out the other end. And what it was is just like three or four slats uh, about three inches across and they would be stapled around a frame at the other end that would go through and there would be a midsection there to, pre to keep the oranges more in place and then those were all picked up and then the lid would go on the top and that's what would be then put into the cooling area down underneath the packing house and then that was what was shipped into a big car load, a, a uh, railroad car load and you would have to have ice on the end of the car on each end of the box car was a section of ice so that those sections where the oranges were packed real close to the ice sometimes those would get very cold and the oranges would spoil sometimes the green, the coolness from the ice didn't migrate to the center enough so that those oranges going across the desert if you were unfortunate enough to have your oranges hit the desert during the day instead of at night those oranges in the center were, would, would suffer from the heat so that was it was a chance farming is a very chancy business so that was the, or, the citrus industry was was one of the big ones from here because of all of the groves around here we have good oranges in placentia because we have good soil in placentia placentia has 10 feet worth of topsoil at one point because of the way the santa ana river overflowed regularly you would have a flood and we're here in the flood plain and that's what made the soil so rich and so the plants the um, Placentia oranges were known for their sweetness. So that was another big selling point. Mr. Bradford could use things like that when he tried to convince the Santa Fe Railroad to run a spur from Fullerton over to Placentia. 
there was a spur line there because um, if you loaded up all of your oranges that were in the crates that were going to be shipped and Mr. Chapman said it took him so long to get from Placentia to Fullerton Packing House that he could only do two car loads a day, two box car loads a day. So he said if they got the spur over here in Placentia, then he would be able to do six car loads a day, thereby increasing his profits and his output and everything like that. So that was why he and Mr. Bradford worked very hard to get the Santa Fe Railroad to agree, and it took them years and years to get the uh, spur line put in. And once it was, then there were seven different packing houses put downtown. There were seven uh, different groups that were then joined together to go out and ship their oranges. Um, it was a great improvement and it was probably the biggest shipping area for freight outside of Los Angeles at the turn of the century. So Mr. Bradford brought the railroad over and he had the town built up. He helped build up the town by encouraging a grocery man to come down and start a store. And he started his store just in the building across from Mr. Bradford's bank. And Mr. Bradford said, well, why don't you uh, hold the post office? Until we get a post office built, you keep it in your store. So that's what he did. So he had his store there with the groceries and you would go in there not only buy stamps, but you would mail your letters. And you could go across the street to Mr. Bradford's bank. Now, Mr. Bradford started the Placentia National Bank, and I've just done some wonderful reading about national banks that you can, um, they issued $5 bills, $10 bills, and $20 bills because that was just about what you could handle in terms of trade. But Mr. Bradford signed the masters so that when you go and find a Placentia National Bank note, which are still around and still visible, um, you can see Mr. Bradford's signature on the $5, $10, and $20 bill. Isn't that incredible? National Bank. Right, so Mr. Bradford had the bank come in. He started the bank and he worked there for about 11 years. He ran that bank and then they issued about $317,000 worth of currency. So somehow or other, I'm not sure how all that works out, but it's like the bonds are replaced with the government and then you can issue the money. So he brought in the bank and he brought in the grocery store. He uh, brought in the post office. He started the Chamber of Commerce then to encourage other businesses to come. So that was kind of a, a good thing. And then he was like the first president of the Chamber of Commerce. And one of the last things he did um, two days before he died was run a Chamber of Commerce meeting. So you can see that's why we call um, A.S. Bradford one of the fathers of Placentia.